It's really a pleasure to welcome everyone to the 2017 University Lecture. Um, and we have, a, I think, a wonderful talk this evening for you. Uh, for reference, the University Lecture dates back to 1950 and is among the most important traditions of Boston University. It highlights uh, the very important foundation of a great research university, which are the outstanding scholars, researchers, and teachers that fuse the missions of scholarship and teaching within the institution. Since 1950, each fall we offer our community and the broader public the opportunity to hear from one of our most distinguished faculty members speaking on their research and scholarship presented for the broader audience. This year's lecturer, Professor Wendy Gordon, is one of our most acclaimed scholars and faculty members. She is the William Fairfield Warren Distinguished Professor of the School of Law. Most here know that Boston University's Warren professors are among our most distinguished faculty members. Selected for their disciplinary prominence, but also their impact on our academic community. Professor Gordon earned her BA at Cornell and her JD at the University of Pennsylvania. Her areas of interest are economics and law, intellectual property, and torts. She has taught at Boston University since 1993, almost a quarter of a century, closing in on it. Her scholarship utilizes economics as well as ethics and analytical philosophy to understand copyright, trademark, and related forms of intellectual property. She is best known for her analyses of copyrights, fair use doctrine, and John Locke's theory of property. She's the author of numerous journal articles and co-editor of two books on the economics of copyright. Her lecture tonight is squarely based upon her work in intellectual property law. The title is The Liberty to Copy Unpatented Inventions, Potential Collisions with Trademark and Copyright Laws. Please welcome Wendy Garden. that very kind introduction, Dr. Brown. And I thank the University Lecture Committee for its invitation. And frankly, I am very honored to be here. I understand now what it means to be humbled by an honor. I am grateful to the many generous minds at BU and elsewhere who have influenced my work. There are so many I'd like to thank, including Stacy Dogan, Bob Bone, Karen Sauer, Stephanie Watts, for example, as well as my husband, Michael Zimmer, that if I named everyone, I'd never escape the podium and you'd never get to the buffet. <laughs> Probably my biggest debt and largest gratitude is to Boston University as a community and a place for mutual engagement. The law school's share in that bounty stems in large part from the efforts of our wonderful and much too modest dean Maureen O'Rourke. Dean O'Rourke has announced that she will be leaving the deanship after 14 years as dean in 2018 and returning to the faculty to celebrate her accomplishments, to welcome her back, and to express my gratitude, I dedicate this lecture to her. Now, Now to my topic, the liberty to copy unpatented inventions. Every day, you buy and enjoy products to which generations of innovators have contributed. Consider a bicycle. There's a frame, seat, springs, steering bar, gears, chain, and brakes. There's also a set of inflatable tires, quite important because in the old days when bicycles went around on rickety wooden wheels, they were known as bone shakers. 
In addition, most bicycles today are attractive. Not sure about that one, but <laughs> most have some claim. The price one pays for a bicycle can be high, but imagine how much higher it would be if we lacked the right to build on improvements made long ago. If the law was different, if, for example, no one could copy any component of a bicycle for a century, the tangle of permissions and fees for any one bike would multiply its cost exponentially. Or consider auto parts. Suppose you bring your car into the repair shop to replace a side mirror. Your mechanic says the replacement will cost $950, and he has some explanation for why, if you get it from the manufacturer. But a generic aftermarket mirror is available for $200, less than a quarter the price. But what if many essential auto parts were protected from duplication for a century? And if, as a result, there were no generic mirrors you could buy? Imagine the impact on your pocketbook. My corner of the, of the world is law, and my square inch in that legal world, my field, is called intellectual property. One of the safeguards that allows us to pay competitive prices for most bikes or auto mirrors is the way in which Congress has set up the various forms of intellectual property law. Congress has adopted short-lived and hard-to-get rights for utilitarian innovations like bikes. That set, that regime, is called patent law. It's short duration of the rights and the difficulty to get those rights, the, both characteristics well known of patent law, suggests that Congress considers exclusive rights in technology to be particularly costly to society. For other kinds of information, Congress has adopted forms of property protection that are easier to require and last a century or even forever. Here's a quick chart. Duration of a patent, 20 years for utility patent, 15 years for design patent. Copyright, a century. Trademark can be perpetual. It's clear that there's something that stirs up the public's jealousy when it comes to closing off rights in utilitarian objects. When you read the case law, it's rife with language like, is this invention worth the embarrassment of a patent? <laughs> now, I want to tell you about those laws, copyright, trademark, in the light of patent, and about a danger posed by a new Supreme Court case. That case, which I'll discuss later, called the Star Athletica, threatens to allow an easy-to-acquire, century-long form of property protection attached to many useful articles. The result may erode the free copying that much competition relies upon. Preliminarily, though, let me drop back a step to explain some of the odd notions that pervade this square inch of the legal world. Consider a new invention, like a particularly effective gear. Installed on a bicycle, the gear looks like a physical object. When an intellectual property lawyer or we call them IP lawyers, focuses on, however, is the way the components of that object are shaped, connected, and organized. To an IP lawyer, how the gear is configured, the pattern in which the molecules need to be arranged, is a form of information that can be owned. The gear on my bike or the gear on your bike is a copy or embodiment of that pattern. You know how in Alice in Wonderland, Humpty Dumpty says, oh, I can make words mean whatever I want them to mean? Well, in law, that's actually permissible. You just have to stipulate a definition. So it may interest you to know that an original oil painting is a copy, according to copyright law, because it's an embodiment of an underlying pattern, which then could be re reproduced in many other posters or um, lithographs and such. Now, this notion of the difference between physical object on the one hand and the information that structures it 
and gives recipes for how to make or copy it is very important to intellectual property law. The same thing is true when it comes to books and literary works. A book looks merely like a physical object. We can pick it up and we can put it down. But the book also contains intangible information, namely the sequence and pattern of the words inside. Each book is an embodiment or copy of a pattern, just like each physical gear is an embodiment or copy of the information that describes it. These patterns of information have value and can be owned. So we have lots of kinds of things that claim to be property in our world. Ordinary property, the kind that you call the police about down the street, they govern what happens if somebody borrows your bike or your book and never returns it. IP law governs what happens if someone duplicates your bike or book. To say that someone owns intellectual property then usually means that the owner of a pattern has a legal right to stop other people from making and selling duplicates, embodying the pattern. Often the owner can also control attempts to vary the pattern. Lawyers say that the owner of intellectual property has exclusive rights, and all the rest of us are said to be under a legal duty. The other side of the right coin is the duty that it imposes on everybody else. The owner of intellectual property has exclusive rights, and the rest of us are under a legal duty to respect those rights. Why would the law ever give such an exclusive right? Curiously, the reason varies as you travel around the world. For example, many copyright systems, particularly on the European continent, are heavily influenced by a kind of natural rights theory. To every cow, its calf might be its motto. In the US, by contrast, our primary reason for giving exclusion rights is to give potential creators economic incentives to create new and more creations. The US Constitution gives Congress power to enact rights for that purpose, and here's the relevant constitutional clause. <coughs> Congress shall have power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their irrespective writings and discoveries. To repeat the beginning of that clause, to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. From that consequentialist perspective, exclusive rights have developed because intellectual products, whether mechanical innovations or books or movies, are usually far easier to copy than to develop. If after years of research and experimentation or drafting and redrafting, an invention or book is put on the market, a number of different things might happen, but there's two polar possibilities. At one side, sometimes the natural advantage in being first on the scene will be enough to give the originator a return on that fixed investment, those years of effort. This is called lead time advantage. However, other times the invention or work of authorship will be quickly copied by strangers who bore none of the development cost and who therefore can sell it more cheaply. So these are just two polar things that could happen in a world without intellectual property. No harm done because of lead time, lots of harm done because there's no one to stop destructive copying. The point of intellectual property law is to change expectations. So people who are afraid to create afraid to spend the amount of time or the amount of money necessary to create something with high fixed costs, will come to expect that if their product has value, they'll be able to reap some of that value. Now, while intellectual property rights have this potential incentive benefit, they also have significant costs. For example, consider how cumbersome licensing can be. In, in addition, every exclusive right has the potential to raise prices, to decrease the number of people who have access to the product, and to discourage the cumulative innovation that is crucial to technological process. In addition, information is inexhaustible, at least physically, 
A million bikes can use the same gear design. A billion voices can sing the same song. I feel like a Coke commercial. <laughs> Pricing something that can be infinitely multiplied without diminution may cause significant waste. Ironically, these two characteristics together, inexhaustibility on the one hand, and the intangible, easy to copy nature of information, work at cost purposes. Co intellectual property law cures the difficulty that's caused by ease of copying by making legal obligations not to copy. But as a result, it cuts off some of the advantages that inexhaustibility could otherwise bring. Now, as mentioned earlier, the categories of IP rights come in three main forms. Copyright law, patent law, and trademark. I'd like to begin with patent law, the category that governs useful inventions, partially because I'm going to use a lot of examples from bicycles and cars. And bicycles and cars are the kind of mechanical innovation whose fate patent law usually determines. Now, I had said that patents were hard to acquire. To explain a little more, to get a patent that covers the utility of an invention, application needs to be made to a governmental office. The applicant has to teach how to make the invention. Significant fees are paid, and the innovation has to pass what you might call tests or standards. The main and hard hardest obstacle is probably showing that your invention is not obvious. In addition, it must be novel. Patents, as, it, as mentioned, generally last no more than 20 years. That means after, after 20 years, anyone can copy that utility patent. The government also offers a design patent to address the ornamental elements of useful objects. Design patents, like the utility patents I just mentioned, have to pass novelty and non-obviousness tests of their own. And like utility patents, they last a short time, 15 years from date of grant. Now, what about items that fail the application process or get patents that are later declared invalid? They, like the expired patents, can be copied. Our question is what happens when some other area of IP law, maybe copyright, maybe unfair competition, maybe trademark, tries to put a duty not to copy on an object that is free for everybody to copy from the perspective of patent law. Patent law is a kind of jealous monarch. In many situations, once it's declared something free, it's like a get out of jail free card in regard to the other IP rights. And that's going to be our general topic, the interconnection sort of competition for who governs and what decisions are made about useful articles. Now, the freedom to copy unpatented products that grows out of patent law is quite deliberate. I'll be telling you about some cases where the Supreme Court explains why patent law not only gives a right to stop copying while the patent's in force, but also a right to copy when no patent is there. Before doing that, though, let me offer a hypothetical, focusing on the rule in patent law that no patent will be given to innovations that are obvious. It suggests why we might want to have rules that instead of saying to every cow it's calf, discriminate among different types of products, sometimes offering restraint, sometimes allowing competition. So here's the simple example. Assume an engineer named Mr. Predictable. You can see where that's going. Mr. Predictable designs a muffler pipe that has a twist in it that keeps the pipe flexible and capable of bouncing back when hit. If the muffler pipe twist was an obvious idea to people in the field, something any expert was likely to explore with a high expectation of success, then the cost of developing it is probably low and the research and development expense could probably be recouped pretty easily. 
through the natural advantage that producers of new items have in the market. And if this lead time advantage suffices to reassure participants that the fixed costs of formulating the obvious innovation will be covered, then incentives are already sufficient. And giving additional revenues via patent law protection would be unnecessary to encourage the innovation. A patent would impose costs without countervailing social benefit. And without patent law, competition in the twisty pipe might flourish to good effect. Of course, prices go down, but also we get user innovation and innovation from a host of additional participants in the industry that might not occur if restraints were in order. Now consider an alternative hypothetical. This one involve the, involves someone named Ms. Ingenious. You know where I'm going again. She develops a special pipe made out of an unusual material that would not have been obvious to other engineers in the field. In the alternative scenario, where it wasn't clear which way to go to find a muffler pipe that could satisfy the demand for strengthening, finding the effective way to strengthen the pipes might have required a substantial R&D budget, to example, for example, with different combinations of pipe shapes, pipe materials, Ms. Ingenious or her backers or employers would be taking a risk that the experiments might never pay off in a saleable product. In circumstances like these, the inventor or the company might have been concerned that its R&D expenses would not be covered by lead time. If so, they might never have begun the search for the new product. Therefore, to encourage innovation that isn't obvious, it might be worthwhile for the law to give the innovator a right to stop competition for, from identical products or near identical products for a limited period of time. The loss to competition is still present, but now there is a potential benefit. A new and non-obvious technology to weigh against the loss. And of course, that's the distinction that patent law makes. The obvious innovation gets no patent. The non-obvious one can have a patent. Now let's get back to my main point, namely the relationship between patent, the patent right to copy things that have no patents, and the rest of the IP world. If a useful device lacks a patent, either because its patents have expired, been invalidated, or because the device didn't meet the patent standards, should this mean that the device is free? for the taking and cannot be protected by other forms of IP. In my opinion, it should, and that has largely, but not unanimously, been the answer of our courts and statutes. If some kind of intellectual property other than patent has the potential to impose on us duties to copy, excuse me, duties not to copy technological devices, perhaps the freedom giving aspect of patent law will be undone. The most famous example of this debate was a lawsuit involving pole lamps back in the 1960s. It showed how our courts should react when a form of intellectual property other than patent tries to impose a duty not to copy useful devices. The case involved a dis dispute between stif stiffle and Sears. According to the Court of Appeals, in four years, Stiffel had shipped about $3,250,000 in pole lamps. That was a lot of money back then. Sears moved in, said the court, when they saw the Stiffel pole lamp was moving toward a mass market, and the Sears lamp retailed at the wholesale price of the Stiffel lamp. Well, Stiffel sued. They had tried for both design and utility patents, but during the suit against Sears, the patents were declared invalid. Therefore, as between Sears and Stiffel, the lamp type was unpatented. Does that mean that Stiffel had no ground to complain if Sears copied? Not quite. Sears faced an additional claim from Stiffel that was not premised on patent law. The relevant state, Illinois, 
had an unfair competition law that could stop the sale of products if similarity in those products' appearance would be likely to confuse consumers. Based on this law, Stifel included in its lawsuit against Sears an assertion and a claim that the similarity of the products that the two stores were selling was leading to a likelihood of confusion. A federal court applying the Illinois law ordered Sears to stop selling the lamps. Sears appealed to the United States Supreme Court. And in 1964, the Supreme Court resoundingly struck down that aspect of the Illinois law which interfered with the federal right to copy unpatented inventions. Here are some quotations. My favorite is the first one from the Sears case. An unpatentable article, like an article on which the patent has expired, is in the public domain and may be made and sold by whoever chooses to do so. Thus, the patent law we learned from Sears not only tells us when to refrain from duplicating another person's product, the patent law also tells us when we are at liberty to copy. The Supreme Court later explained Sears in this way. This is one of my favorite quotes because I like each part of it. And my laser pointer isn't wonderful, so let's try it. It begins, in regard to mechanical configurations, Congress has balanced. What are they balanced? They've been the need to encourage innovation and originality, that is the incentive side of things, against the need for competition in the sale of identical or similar products. That balance is one that has a particular seesaw point not to be buried at whim. The standards established by granting federal patent protection to machines thus indicated not only which articles in this particular category Congress wished to protect, but which configurations it wished to remain free. The right to copy unpatented inventions has important effects, keeping prices down, fostering cumulative innovation, spreading products to the populace. Also, as a case emphasized in 1989, it is the background against which the patent system can operate effectively. It is actually necessary for the patent system to induce people to disclose inventions to the patent office and to follow through. The language, the efficient operation of the federal patent system depends upon substantially free trade and publicly known unpatented design and utilitarian conceptions. That quotation comes from a case called Bonito Boats, which assessed the legitimacy of a Florida law which gave the designers of boat hulls a right against direct molding of their unpatented boat designs. And it was an unlimited right in terms of years, perpetual. By this time, 1989, people had noticed that Sears had some overemphasis on some aspects, and the case was not quite as strong in its presidential value. So it might have been a chance that the Florida law might have survived. But the Supreme Court struck it down quite emphatically and reaffirmed the Sears opinion, stating that, quote, federal patent laws do create a federal right to copy and to use. Is the public's right to copy unpatented objects therefore secure? I still can't give you a resounding yes because there's a conceptual fly in the ointment. In the two cases I just mentioned, Sears and Benito Boats, the Supreme Court was articulating the liberty to copy in the context of conflicts between federal laws and state laws. In our system, since the US Constitution specifies that federal law is the supreme law of the land, federal patent law clearly invalidates inconsistent state laws. This is called preemption. It's far less clear what happens 
when federal laws have the potential to interfere with each other. And there are two federal laws that might conceivably interfere with the patent law right to copy and to use. I'm going to examine both of those through, guess what, a bicycle example. One is federal copyright law and the other is federal trademark law. Before getting to the example, let me just mention a little more background. Federal trademark and copyright are deeply affected by patent policy. Congress has built the federal intellectual property law structure so that copyright and trademark largely defer to federal patent law when it comes to utilitarian devices. That is, Congress has put explicit language in federal copyright and trademark statutes that to some extent emulate what happens in those Supreme Court decisions I just described to you. Explicit rules guard the patent boundary. It's not that copyright or trademark say, this must be in the public domain. Rather, they say, we don't handle this. This particular kind of subject matter is something about which patent law must make the decision. Sometimes this is called channeling subject matters to other areas of law. But these channeling doctrines have some difficulties. As my friend and colleague, a oh, former colleague and always friend, Bob Bone, <laughs> recently reminded me, firms with exclusive rights will often stretch them in any manner they can in order to maximize revenue. In the face of insistent pressure by aspiring intellectual property owners, will current boundary rules suffice? As I will explain in a moment, trademark boundary guardian seems to be doing its job fairly well. However, one of copyright's boundary guardians might be in trouble. So, let's work through that example I mentioned. Let's go back to bicycles. Handlebars. Handlebars can be a real problem for bikes because the UM back is so variable and so potentially painful. Some bike riders like to have their hands higher than the seat. This one, as you see, has handlebars that rise. Some want the bars at seat level. Some people need the bars to be lower in order to maximize both speed and comfort. Assume now that someone is developing a new handlebar that is capable of meeting many different riders' needs. The new handlebar has a place for high hands, medium hands, and low hands, all without biking, bulking up the bike or making it clumsy. Say this inventor of the one-size-fits-all handlebar, let's call him Bicycle Jim, began with using an existing popular model of handlebar. I'm going to assume that the following is what that existing handlebar looked like. Now, assume that Jim removed the hand grips from each end, which the hand grips aren't even in the picture, replaced them with sets of collapsible ribbing that could be extended horizontally at different levels parallel to that existing bar. That's the combination of elements he intends to duplicate and sell. Jim's design, since it still incorporates most of the existing handlebar, contains a copy of that handlebar that will continue if he goes into manufacturing as he plans. Now, assume that that existing handlebar has neither a design patent or a utility patent. Given the lack of patent, will it be clear that Bicycle Jim can copy that ha handlebar, alter it, and manufacture his new bar as he wants? Not quite. Both federal copyright and federal trademark law pose a potential difficulty. So, I'm going to first look at the problems that might be caused if whoever made that handlebar seeks a trademark interest in it, and then what would happen if that person sought a copyright interest in it. So, how might trademark law and in the federal world, it's run by the Lanham Act. How much might trademark law impede Jim's right to copy and sell this presumably unpatented thing? Trademarks are means to identify and distinguish goods from those manufacturers 
from by others and indicate the source of the goods. Most of us think of trademarks as words, like perhaps Nike, or symbols like an Apple on a Mac computer. But packaging and even product shapes can have federal trademark protection under the doctrine known as trade dress. What primarily matters is whether the shape is distinctive in the sense of signaling meaning about source to consumers. If, it's, if something qualifies as a trademark, other people in the market, mark, excuse me, if a symbol or shape qualifies as a trademark, other people in the marketplace might be ordered to stop using similar shapes or symbols if their use were likely to confuse potential buyers. And over time, the notion of what counts as confusion and whose confusion has expanded. So trademark law has a quite a bit of threat potential. Now, in the abstract, there's no reason why consumer expectations might not crystallize around a handlebar. If over time, consumers had come to associate the shape of the existing handlebar with a particular source, could its seller, whoever made that bar we had up there, could its seller, I know, sorry, pointing to um, a prior slide, bad, bad form. <laughs> if over time consumers had come to associate the shape of the existing handlebar with a particular source, could its seller have accrued federal trade dress rights? If so, Bicycle Jim might have something to worry about because his object is pretty similar to the object I'm not going to point to because it's not there. <laughs> All right, there it is. He's just adding these struts and collapsible gadgets to it. So they might be similar enough if the maker of the now visible handlebar sought uh, trade dress rights. There might be confusion if both were in the marketplace at the same time. But actually, the problem is smaller than that because in the federal trademark statute, Congress declared that functional features cannot be protected as trade dress, no matter what meaning the features may have for consumers. That's what I meant by these copyright and trademark statutes have internal provisions to some extent emulating the preemption structure that we saw in Benito Boats and Sears Comco. Since any ordinary observer would call the handlebar a functional object, is, does that mean Jim is safe? Well, maybe not. As I said about the word copy, that an original painting could be a copy, every word in law can be subject to an almost endless debate. And the law of trade dress boils with debates focusing on how to define functionality. In particular, what I would be worried about on behalf of Jim is that the federal circuit's approach makes it harder to find a shape functional and therefore not a trademark if competitors have available to them a number of alternative and effective designs. Or putting it differently, the federal circuit's approach makes it easier to say that a particular thing is a trademark if there are alternatives for competitors to use. So if there are many good alternatives to the um, handlebar we've been looking at, some courts might find the shape subject to protection under federal trade dress, even if in ordinary parlance, the shape helps the product to do its job. But the ordinary meaning of functionality is not always the one the courts will use. Jim and his investors might be subject conceivably to suit under trademark law. And there needs be no advance permission sought to get a trademark, unlike patent. It's a much easier process in many ways. And that's not good for Jim's business at this point. But there is some good news for Jim regarding trademark and trade dress. In 2001, a Supreme Court decision called Traffics, with an X, it signaled a greater deference to the public's freedom to copy unpatented inventions. The Traffics case involved an expired patent for a stand, a pic picture there, with dual springs that held signs steady against the wind. When the patent expired, the manufacturer argued that consumers had come over time to associate the appearance of the dual spring design with its source, so the trade dress protection 
should be available to him. And there may well have been alternative designs that competitors could adopt. But the Supreme Court emphatically rejected the possibility of trade best protection for that design. The court ruled the dual spring design functional, therefore incapable of serving as a trademark, no matter what consumer expectations would have been. And the court explicitly made this finding independent of what alternatives might or might not be available to competitors. We could be more sure of safety for Jim from trademark suits if we knew exactly how far tr the traffic's precedent reaches. It's, it's most applicable in the case of an expired patent, and Jim may not face that. Nevertheless, since the traffic's opinion in 2001, courts have tended to treat functionality broadly, disqualifying more and more things that we might think of as product shapes from the ability to be used as trademarks. As this approach rose in importance, Jim's safety from trademark-inspired attacks grows more secure. Now I move to my favorite topic, which is copyright. And this is the area in which the new case came down this spring, Star Athletica, that I find a little worth worrying about, that I wanted to alert you to. So the question, just to be explicit, that we're asking is whether the designer of that existing handlebar have a federal copyright in it. Now, copyrights arise automatically. Every time you write a letter to someone, every time you doodle practically, you're going to have a copyright in these things. Copyright arises automatically whenever a work of authorship is embodied in something tangible, written down, taped, built. And the test, the prerequisite for protection, is remarkably easy to meet. It doesn't have to be novel. It doesn't have to be non-obvious. It has to be merely original. And that's usually defined as saying some aspect of the work must have its origin with the copyright owner and he or she needs to exhibit some creativity in the work. But the level of creativity required is low. Even a small spark will suffice. And once the copyright attaches, it endures for a very long time. Now, applying these originality standards, it isn't crazy to see the existing bar as potentially a sculpture, potentially maybe copyrightable. If one stood the bar up vertically like that and removed the big gears and hand grips, it calls to mind many modern sculptures. Maybe even, if we're going to be very charitable, Brancusi's Bird in Space. <laughs> so maybe that existing handlebar is a kind of sculpture. How would it affect Jim if the maker of that existing handlebar sought or got a copyright in it. The law of federal copyright grants a right against copying, against making variations, and against selling of an unlawfully made copying. It would be a bit of a disaster for Jim if it, that prior handlebar had copyright, leaving him to the uh, possibilities of negotiation and licensing, which might or might not work out. But would copyright apply? Well. Copyright has internal guardians of many kinds against overstepping patent boundaries. One of them is called the separability test. And it applies to aspiring cultural, sculptural works that are both aesthetically pleasing and serve a utilitarian purpose. Objects that fail the test might be protected by something like design or utility patent. They don't necessarily go completely without protection but copyright would be unavailable to them. For the bicycle handle that Jim wants to copy, to have a copyright, he would have to pass the separability test. The features of a youthful article, if they want to even try to qualify for copyrighted sculptures, must pass the test which says the design of a useful article shall be considered a sculptural work if and only to the extent that such design incorporates pictorial, 
graphic, or sculptural features that can be identified separately from and are capable of existing independently of the utilitarian aspects of the article. Now, up until the Star Athletica case that came down this spring, it would have been very clear that the handlebar Jim wants to copy would be ineligible for copyright, inseparable. What does count as separable? Well, the legislative history that created the test mentions floral designs on flatware or carvings on the back of a chair. What's notable about these examples is that copyright in the art, that is, the floral design or the carvings design, could be enforced without restraining anyone from copying the useful aspects of the product. Consider, if copyright applied only to a carving and not to the well-balanced silverware itself, or embellishments, someone who wanted to copy the utilitarian features of the silverware or furniture could lawfully copy them. To avoid copyright liability, all they'd need to do is simply blank out the carving or scrape off the embellishments. Or consider another instance, this one drawn from case law, a lamp base made in the shape of a Balinese dancer. Even if the dancer had a copyright, the lamp's structure could be copied. The copier could escape copyright liability merely by smoothing off or covering over the dancer's features. So the dancer is separable because it can be protected by copyright without impairing people's ability to copy whatever is the utilitarian aspect of that lamp structure. During this spring, as I mentioned, a new view of copyright came out. In the Star Athletica case, separability veered in a new direction, one in which the very notion of separability begins to crumble. Star Athletica involved the alleged copying of colorful surface designs on cheerleader uniforms. The court, through Justice Thomas, articulated a new test to determine what counts as separability. First, he wrote the decision maker must spot some two or three dimensional element that appears to have pictorial, graphic, or sculptural qualities. Second, Justice Thomas directed that the feature be imagined apart from the useful article and that the decision maker assess whether it constitutes a work of authorship. And as for the crucial question, the portion of the useful article that remained that would not be covered by copyright, which therefore, if unpatented, could be copied by everyone. As for the portion of the useful article that remained after the imaginative separation, Justice Thomas surprisingly stated, the statute does not require the imagined remainder to be a fully functioning useful article at all, much less an equally useful one. In other words, in this new case, it's possible that copyright enforcement might embrace part of what made the article function. So let's play with this star and in athletic interpretation of separability to see what would happen with Bicycle Jim. As mentioned, under the tra more traditional, but somewhat controversial, because they never agreed with each other, approaches of separability, I can imagine or think of none that would have given copyright to the handlebar. Things are a little different after Star Athletica. It's not so hard first to spot the athletic aesthetic elements, and one can certainly imagine portions of that graceful bar as a work of art, particularly once it's separated from the hand grips and other hardware, as Justice Thomas seems to suggest. Thomas even wrote that the ultimate question is whether a feature would have been eligible for copyright protection had it originally been fixed in some medium other than a useful article before being applied to a useful article. Well, if that up, if an upthrusting bar had been built without reference to the useful article, that is, the bike, or were it imagined standing alone, with no connection to bicycles, it might well be seen as creative enough to obtain a copyright. Now, I admit, it's really not as elegant as Brancusi's <laughs> bird inspection. But it does have a bit of its umbrio. 
And as I mentioned, copyright attaches very easily. If so, the ordinary freedom to copy the unpatented handlebar will have come undone. It may be subject to federal copyright for a good long time. Now I have another example, but let me just summarize it very quickly. Consider this bike rack. It started life as a sculpture on somebody's desk, small, wiry. When it was turned into a bike rack and its copyrightability came up for discussion, a federal court refused to give it copyright because it failed the separability test. Well, what about today under Star Athletica? Well, you're supposed to imagine it's separate from the useful article role. At least that's one interpretation that seems clear on the face of the opinion. So you cut off the feet, the connect this to the ground, that make it usable and stable as a bicycle rack, and you imagine it separated, maybe hanging from a very long wire, like a mobile. Well, if you looked at that mobile and focused on the undulating curves, you might well think, well, that's a work of authorship. And the fact that all that's left is a sort of useless bunch of feet ready to be screw screwed into the sidewalk wouldn't seem to matter to Justice Thomas. So the danger is that given the breadth of what can be considered art, a multitude of ordinary objects might be viewable today as copyrightable works of authorship under this new case. Copyright could expand into what ought to be patent law's dominion over mechanical innovation. Legal restraints over everyday objects would multiply. Now this may not necessarily happen. Copyright has other limiting doctrines that may mute the impact of Star Athletica. In addition, the Star Athletica opinion itself has amb ambiguities and dare, I th and, dare I say it, inconsistencies that lower courts can utilize to narrow the ruling. Nevertheless, the Star Athletica opinion deserves attention for it threatens to reverse long-standing priorities and transform competition in product markets at a cost to us all. In conclusion, I'd hazard a guess about why some of this is happening. Part of it is that Justice Thomas wrote a formalistic opinion, not explicitly not interested in policy. So he may not have been conscious of Congress's long division of labor among patent, copyright, and the rest. Oh, but there's other things going on. Over the last half century, copyright and its cousins have been expanding in both Congress and the courts. Part of the reason for the trend is doubtless an antipathy for so-called free riders, those who reap where they haven't sown, and conversely, judges sympathy for authors. Perhaps naturally, this pair of sentiments can lead judges to ignore boundaries that classify which kind of rewards should attach to which kind of effort. The boundaries are, however, crucial. Giving copyright claimants a century of rights over functional innovations, particularly since copyright requires no judgment to be ever made about novelty or non-obvious, is, to use the Supreme Court's word and words from a related context, it's a fraud and surprise upon the public. The Star Athletica decision threatens to divert patent applicants from patents to the Copyright Office instead and threatens to render irrelevant much of which Congress enacted in patent law, raising prices for virtually everyone. After Star Athletica, easy to obtain copyrights may put that $950 car mirror or the ultra expensive bicycle in everybody's future. In conclusion, I just want to thank everyone for coming, for commenting in advance as so many of you did and I look forward to any questions you may have.
Thank you. I uh, had a question about what I have heard referred to as submarine patents. Is that a term of art that, you're, that you've encountered? Yes. Okay, Although, so, you're, uh, continue, well, Tom. My, my, my question would be that it's my understanding that, that submarine patents are patents which are developed without the ultimate goal of uh, product development or implementation or execution in mind. They are essentially patents of, con of conceptual uh, inventions and that the inventor, having obtained the patent, simply sits back and waits for others to do more complex uh, product development and testing and, uh, and designing. And once the concept has been realized, steps forward and says, I patented that, you now owe me a license fee. Well, what you're talking about now is a phenomenon that I, as a copyright person, haven't litigated or anything, but have certainly have been reading about. But I'm not sure the word submarine patent is as good a uh, label as troll. But let me just generalize for a moment. Crucial to um, some of the problems with intellectual property creating uh, barriers to innovation is the question of notice. Um, it has, there's been recent reforms to make patent applications more available and in addition um, there's been some efforts in the copyright area to figure out what to do about the fact that nobody can identify the authors of, let's say, orphan works that are found in archives. So the notice problem and how to deal with the lack of identities um, or the lack of substance, we don't know what's being claimed in patent, is part of the problem you're raising. Uh, so Wendy, what's to be done? Um, if we accept this possible interpretation of Star Athletica, um, and we also accept our role as advocates working within this system. Is there any room in the opinion that gives us some flexibility to advocate for a push in the other direction, or do we need an overruling of this opinion? Well, the opinion, as I said, has what I would call inconsistencies in it. Part of it is, this is supposed to be an opinion to tell you what part of a useful article can be copyrighted, but it also says, if after the imaginative separation, it's a useful article, it can't be copyrighted. It's sort of recursive, it goes sort of like in a circle. And they have an example, they say, if something is intrinsically useful, like a shovel, you can't copyright it. But they give no definition of intrinsic, and, nor do they have a de definition of art. All of these things, um, plus a sort of obscure analysis of surface decorations on a guitar, um, have raised puzzles in virtually everybody's mind. But when it comes down to the tests that Thomas directs you to do, and his ultimate question, which seems to be, could this thing be art if it was created without reference to a useful article, direction seems more dangerous than helpful. Stephen? Yeah. In, I don't want to um, be unfair and bring in trade secrets, but um, <coughs> the... Um, let me ask uh, whether you have any opinion on whether the idea of whether something is property or not make a difference. And this is something that um, <clears throat> I guess at WIPO we're trying to argue whether it's trade secret property or not property. But you know, the, uh, actually to, to the, sum, the um, troll idea, uh, before eBay of course there was the idea that uh, patents were property in the sense of getting injunctions on behalf of people who made some claim uh, that, uh, that passed. And after that, it's, it's become, in a way, more of a, um, I suppose in Calabrese's view, and more of a uh, liability theory of entitlement. That is, you know, you, you don't get um, a benefit unless you're actually competing. So, the, it, so does property have any meaning today? Well, an awful lot of ink has been spilled on the question. Um, in my view, property, anything is property where, where you have 
a right to use it, or a, a liberty more technically, liberty to use it more ex extensively than other people. You have some right to stop other people from using it, and you can transfer it. That is far from, however, the elaborate Blackstonian conception which sees in property something almost holy. I have a stewardship conception of property that we give property rights for particular purposes. Now, get, get your trade secrets for the, for the moment. My analysis of trade secrets really follows on David Friedman's. That is, I don't see them as um, property at all. Rather, if someone has kept something some secret and it continues to use safeguards, the trade secret laws give them a little backup so they don't have to overspend in a sort of war of self-protection with people who want to spy on them. I know the Supreme Court said that there was no preemption of trade secrets. I think that was just giving into an institutional past. I don't see much use in trade secrets other than this savings of cost on mutual wars of self-help. But preemption is gone because of the Defend Trade Secrets Act. Uh, that does, that right. has changed things. Right. The Kiwani is still worth studying. Right. Uh, hi, um, you talked a little bit about boundaries between the different protection systems like copyright and patent. Could you envision a scenario in which an inventor um, doesn't, uh, doesn't have the money, for example, to get a patent, uh, the 20-year protection monopoly, but then tries to go down the copyright road? So they write an instruction manual that's 100 pages and describes in every which way that this widget could be possibly formed or go together, that on their website they described every possible use and, and expression. This, this is, you're describing very much a case called Baker v. Selden in the 1800s. Although in that case, there were just forms, as I recall. That's so you true. can kind of bring it Ooh, down. Malice of forethought, you know what you're doing. <laughs> so I'm talking about the opposite. In that case, I think they brought it down to the crux of the, the form, right? So it came down to almost like a calendar or an accounting spreadsheet. So in this case, they purposely um, you know, abound the expression in every which way, so that almost an infringer would have to copy something of its expression to get it out onto the market. Well, part of the argument that had been made in Baker, going up to the Supreme Court, was you got to use some of our forms to use our underlying idea, our, other, our underlying bookkeeping practice. Therefore, since we have copyright in the forms, and since they're essential, nobody can use our bookkeeping practice but us. Supreme Court turned that on its head and said, among other things, if something is truly essential that's aesthetic or graphic, like a form, if it's truly essential to using an underlying utilitarian idea, then it must be given to the public. So their view was, no matter how, in fact, they say over and over again, there are wonderful books that are explanatory of an art or a science, but they give no rights over the practice of the art or science. And that's where the language about surprise or fraud upon the public comes from. It, the Supreme Court said to give copyright protection in something useful, albeit indirectly through, let's say, a form or a book, to give such protection when no examination of novelty has ever been made would be a surprise and fraud upon the public. So it would be a very different system than ours. Yes. Hi. Uh, could you comment on um, your thoughts on how this new development in copyright law might affect um, other utilitarian things like s computer software? Ah. <laughs> okay. Congress followed the recommendation of an entity called CONTU um, to put computer software in the copyright statute. If you read the CONTU report, it's all full of qualifications, like only the expressive aspects of computer programs are covered. The functional aspects of computer programs must be covered by patent, if at all. But what happens is, when something lands in the territory, people glom onto it. And we've had a number of fascinating and largely inconsistent decisions. Let me just mention two that are quite different. In one case, Lotus v. Borland, the charge was made that it was copyright infringement to copy a command menu hierarchy from somebody else. And the court said, no, I'm command menu hierarchy. 
Hierarchy is a way of using the program. It's like a button on a VCR. The button can be big, the button can be small, but it's a way of making the VCR go on and off. I can't use the program without this, so it's functional. Methods of operation cannot be copyrighted. The end. More recently, in um, Oracle versus Google, a debate, uh, I mean, a dispute about copying of certain Java header commands and some of Java's structure, the court took the very opposite approach. It said, because there's so many different ways to organize these things and so many different ways to name them, it's conceivable they could all be copyrighted. So, this use of alternatives to save things from the public domain, one court uses, and the other says, I don't care how many alternatives there are, if you use it to make the thing go on and off, then it must be functional and not part of copyright. Right now, it, computer software is the most fascinating and the most schizophrenic part of what we call copyright jurisprudence. Thank you. Two more questions. Yes. Thank you. Right. Uh, in the innovative Stifel lamp case, the, uh, the, co the patent is not granted due to lack of innovation, due to could lack you, of... Could you speak into the microphone, please? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. In the uh, Stifel lamp case, the patent is not granted due to the lack of novelty, innovation. Uh, but the fact that they did it first, uh, what if I make a case that by uh, simply manufacturing the, this kind of product and putting it onto the market, the manufacturer bears a risk of the consumer not accepting it, of the product being a, a failure and costing the money. The, yes. the action of putting this, uh, this product into the market is essentially a market research. Is in market research a form of R&D and grants some um, like exclusive rights to the company that puts it onto the market first? I'm, I'm just a little puzzled where you're coming from. Let me just give you a response mm -hmm. that may or may not be where you're going. Um, patent law says we don't want to give strong exclusive rights unless this thing that's going on is mm -hmm. both novel and non-obvious and somebody's gone through the trouble of proving it um, to the satisfaction of a government examiner. Um, if it doesn't meet that standard, then it's either got to be aesthetic and separable, mm -hmm. usually, or it's got to be um, subject to consumer um, expectations. I think the bottom line is this. There's a lot of sentiment in many na nations for rewarding people who take socially beneficial risks. Um, but the usual rule in our, in our country, which you'll find under the heading of restitution law or unjust enrichment, is that unless you get a contract in advance you, from people who you're going to benefit, you can't complain when they don't pay you. So if you find a nook where people aren't doing enough of a particular kind of productive behavior, mm -hmm. the common law isn't going to help you because the common law will say they've got to get their c customers before they can sue anyone. And if you want to give an intellectual property right, it would have to be quite different from any of the ones I know about right now. So all I'm saying is you can make an argument sometimes why more protection might be useful. It doesn't mean that it fits our system all that well. Okay, that answers it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, sorry to drag you back into computer science, but... He knows uh, more about it than I do. What's the question, Matthew? Well, there are multiple protections, as you, we've talked about this evening. There's the patent protection, there's copyright protection, there's trade secret protection, and there's even an argument to be made for trademark protection in software. How is anyone ever going to keep that straight? <laughs> Actually, my own preferred approach is a doctrine we haven't talked about tonight. It's a distinction between use on the one hand and explanation on the other. The lady who raised Baker v. Selden, this is very much about your issue. Baker not only said that those graphs and char uh, charts for the bookkeeping thing couldn't be copyrightable. They also said if they had been copyrightable, the copyright would have been good only as against other works of explanation, not against them actually being used. And we have a rule like that for drawings. that say a drawing can be copyrightable, like a drawing of Van Gogh's old shoes, 
But that right in your copyright, although usually it extends to three-dimensional things, would not allow you to sue someone who made the shoes in three dimensions capable of wearing them. That is, the copyright can be limited to the purpose of certain purposes in terms of the scope of the right. And if somebody makes something not to explain, not to explore appearance, but to make it a functional working object, it may be at liberty to go forward. Thank you, Wendy. Thank Let's you. Thank Wendy. Well, and as we always traditionally end the uh, evening before the reception, which is outside, two things for Wendy. One is a framed poster of the announcement, and the other is to check. A check? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't tell you that. Thank you. Thank you.